Welcome to About That. My name is Dasha. Kelly Hamilton, you are digitally at the retreat right now. And About That is a conversation series that uses art as a way to frame the conversations we all are having. So tonight is About That Motherland. And it was prompted by a film by a, a Nigerian filmmaker named Katun Adawak. And he has a film where it explores this conversation about assumptions, about expectations, about the narratives that we're handed about where you come from and who you are. And it raised a, a question about the tension or perceived tension sometimes between Africans and African-Americans. So it's broadened the conversation about that motherland, about the idea of living in one place and honoring a second place and both of them being considered home. Those are unique tensions, unique dynamics, unique blessings, and definitely a unique conversation. And I'm excited for the uh, the artists and the humans that have agreed to come and share their stories and give us some insight and have a little bit of a conversation about that motherland. So our first guest coming to the stage is Araceli Esparza. She is a activist and an artist based out of Madison, Wisconsin. I'm gonna bring her to the screen. Welcome. Hello, hi. How are you, Miss Lady? I am doing really good, thank you. So I am, uh, before we get into this conversation of about that motherland, just curious, how are you settling in this, <laughs> these unique days that we're having? These are some different days for sure. Time just keeps on going and it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Yes, these are some strange days, but they're good. It's, at the same time, they help us reflect to these topics. Most definitely. So can you tell us a little bit about Wisconsin Mohair? Um, yeah, so Wisconsin Mohair, I, I'm just trying to get the right lighting, of course, because yeah. that's, <laughs> that's our expertise is like is doing um, social media engagement ev events. Uh, we work around, uh, work with uh, marginalized communities and uplifting their voices. Our motto is to breaking the isolation of Latinas living in the Midwest. And so we do that through various different types of events and um, networking and community building. So when you have this uh, invitation to have a conversation about motherland, yeah, tell us a little bit where that took you. I, I I was really honored that you would think about um, the motherland and think about Wisconsin Mohair at the same time. Um, it's a it's interesting when I first started with that um, with that tag on Twitter many 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 years ago. Um, I had people come to me thinking that I was like a representative for the whole state as far as like Latina voices. I had like um, CNN and Fox News they would at me at certain times. And so when I think about the motherland and this um, conversation, I definitely think about Wisconsin Mohair and the branding, even um, half the name being Wisconsin and the other half of the name being Mohair, um, a Spanish word for woman. And we have to translate that at all spaces where I'm at. Um, it's okay um, that most, you know, some people do know that Muhead means woman, but oftentimes they don't. And it's really done, it's really on purpose because I'm, it's the melding of both cultures and both motherlands, both uh, my Mexican roots and my, my roots here in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and homage to the land, right? Because both lands are really um, impactful for me. How have you navigated that? or I'd imagine there's some navigating to that. So they're both impactful and you're in the middle and that just by geometry means that <laughs> there's something to manage. Oh, absolutely. So my family are migrant workers and that's how we ended up in Wisconsin in the most Northern state. Like I I remember going to Mexico and telling Wisconsin, I'm like, it's still north, it's still more north than Chicago. <laughs> Chicago like, like, well, Spain isn't so. They're like, wait, are you close by like the North Pole? I'm like, well, no, there's Canada. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's still the Canada on the landmass. Yeah, yeah, I'm not like that north. I mean, it is winter and there it is, is wind. And it is curious um, <laughs> for all for all peoples to end up in this so far north and it's cold yeah. and so far from the edge of the continent, the borders of the. So I I, I could appreciate how it would be. You were where? How did that yeah. happen? 
So yeah, like, yeah, it's that. always a geography lesson. Absolutely. It's a big ge geography lesson. And it just the topography too of both those lands, you know, um, here it's, well, you know, you go past Verona, it's a little bit more like the Driftless and more hilly, but where we are, it's like kind of dipped in and in where we're from in my, my part of Mexico, at least where my family's from in Guanajuato, um, it's very hilly and it's called the Bajillo and it's like always 60 degrees weather. And so it's a really stark difference. I have a lot of friends, uh, cousins of mine that, and friends, that would literally say, you know, as I was growing up, I would probably die <laughs> of the cold. Like they could not imagine how cold and like how people could really live in this cold weather. Um, so a lot of my work uh, in poetry as well is like that intersectionality of um, both lands of like having something that's from somewhere so warm and so different. And so, uh, yeah, just a juxtaposed, right? Those juxtaposed images. And so, yeah. I'd be curious, what are the parts of <clears throat> of your cousins is 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 your cousins? Like when my cousins cousins and I text each other, it's always C U Z Z I N, because that's how it feels. Right? <laughs> right, right, right. So what part of your cousins experience is hard for you to imagine? Um I mean, I was traveling down there since I was like six months old. So it was it, being a migrant part of part of part of being a migrant family is that you're traveling back and forth consistently. So I did know a little bit of what they did. I guess I didn't understand the expectations. They actually have, they, at least where we're from in Mexico, their education level was much higher than here. And the expectations were, oh. were much more rigorous as far as like gender roles go and what a girl was supposed to do and what a boy was supposed to do. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, so the it was very binary, and certainly like um, just the being of American descent just like allowed me to like break through those binary roles for gender, and and I think that's where just because yeah, <laughs> in in Mexican tradition and culture, you know, it's like a very heterosexual lifestyle, and so it's so. And growing up in a place like Madison, Wisconsin, which is like super ultra liberal, very open to relationships and experiences. Um, it was really, um, I'm sure it was hard for them to understand even what I, where I was coming from. I could kind of get where they were coming from a lot of times, but two, didn't understand like what the things that tethered them to those roles, right? And so, yeah, yeah. What tethers <laughs> them to those roles is, is a lot of heart and loyalty. And unless you are from there, you might not <laughs> you right. wouldn't adhere to that. I really appreciate that language because the, the idea of being tethered uh, compared to, it's more of a being liberated that you just know how things go. So depending on what side of that expectation you sit on, will, will definitely dictate how you describe it. I want to, and I made that note because I definitely want to come back to that. I'm going to have you have a go to the green room for a minute. So I'm yeah. gathering, we're gathering all these commentaries and notes. And for those that are watching online, you can be a part of this conversation as well. So any comment that you I'm add, in. any comment that you add in the thread, be it on uh, YouTube or on Facebook, we'll be able to include those questions and commentary into this conversation. So our next conversation kickstarter is uh ck ledesma bring you onto the screen how are you dear good how are you i am actually well i'm actually well so i'm always energized when i get a chance to um have unstructured but kind of structured conversations with people who have a lot of heart so i'm i am in a great space right now so you definitely qualify for that thank you so much for having me i'm i'm honored and feel very very blessed to be here Thank Absolutely. You. So we've had a chance to um, kind of lead into the discussion about where this could start. And I think what I want to do is just let you rip and go. Um, so if you want to give a like 90 second snippet of who you are, and then I'm just going to let you go. OK, cool. Um, so, yeah, like Dasha mentioned, my name is TK Ledesma. Uh, my pronouns are he, uh, he, she, they. I use all three. Um, I think identity and gender identity really has a huge role on, on motherland, too, on this conversation of what we consider uh, home. I was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I'm actually in Puerto Rico right now. I'm sitting in the home that I grew up in. It was my grandparents' home. It is the home that now my mother lives in, and hopefully it'll be the home that I will continue to live in um, after, um, you know, 
Milwaukee doesn't become home anymore, but I do live between both places. Um, as a kid, I, I, I was raised in, Milwaukee, in Puerto Rico, but then I lived in Milwaukee for three years of my childhood. Um, I lived in River West, and then I came back to Puerto Rico for two years, and then I went back to Milwaukee. Um, I lived in the South Side in Clark Square neighborhood, and then okay. I came back to Puerto Rico. So, like my my upbringing has been very much between both lands. Okay. Um, and even though Milwaukee is home, and and I am a U.S. citizen, I think this conversation of motherland has had me thinking of citizenship a lot about um, what does it mean to be an actual citizen of the United States and what the, the structures of government that Puerto Rico have in place, um, how those intersect with what is a citizen, who has the rights of a citizen, um, uh, and, and just those conversations, right? It, it's part that I, that uh, an experience that I had, I was traveling abroad and somebody, um, going through the border, somebody asked me and said, um, you know, where, where, where are you from, what's your citizenship? And I responded immediately, Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican is not a citizenship. Um, it has never been because of the colonial um, powers that have ruled over the island for so many years since its, its inception. What? Yeah, right. Like, we, it's not a citizenship. It's not a country. It's 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 a colony. I'm an American citizen. But my my gut reaction was, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm, I'm a Puerto Rican citizen. But but I'm not. Even though my heart and my soul are Puerto Rican, my citizenship on paper is American, right? Um, so that's sort of where, where, what I was simmering in colony and, and citizenship and what rights we do get to have and not have being um, uh, a commonwealth state of the United States. And I say that in quotation because mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of red, red tape that goes around um, uh, the things that we have access to rather than the people that are in the continental U.S. Um, and I think everybody has seen that in the conversations uh, around Hurricane Maria and the recent earthquakes. And and, and right now, during during COVID-19, we get to see um, so, so a, lot, a lot of laws that are in place that don't really apply to us in, in many ways. So yeah, that's, that's sort of the thoughts that I was simmering on when this conversation came. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to take yeah. you back to um, just who you are, okay. so you and those pieces, and yeah. then um, I want you to come back and pick up on the colonization point. So just yeah. generally, you're yeah, you make what you yeah. what to do. So, who yeah, are you? I'm a maker. <laughs> you're a maker. I'm a maker. Yeah. yeah. I'm a maker. Yes, I am a maker. Um, uh, I studied uh, painting and art history, and I am a community engaged artist. I have a initiative or a community-based um, program called Cosecha Creative Space. Yep, it's right there. <laughs> um, Cosecha Creative Space, where we connect with people and communities through art to to listen uh, to what is that the community is 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 living and what it is that is going on, and see if there's ways in which we can meet those gaps in what the community is talking and bubbling about, right? Because um, it's a creative space is many things, um, not just art, but also social interactions. Uh, being Puerto Rican, I'm a huge foodie and uh, food is at the center and heart of a lot of things that I do. Most definitely. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So I, you know, I have the benefit of, of knowing the, the different ways that you express right. how you live out loud. So and I think for the folks that are paying attention, that's going to be really helpful um, and inspiring as they listen to you share your perspective. So when you started with Motherland, you kind of gave a sense of, you know, living between two places mm -hmm. and you've got this piece of paper that says one thing and your reality that says the same thing. Um, in a different way, right? So, but you landed on this idea of colonialism and especially in how and you were talking about how it, how you find yourself showing up or not, or showing up and in both places. So talk a little bit more of how that landed with your your meditation on motherland. Well, I, this is a conversation that I simmer on not just for this conversation, but also for my personal practice because it's deeply rooted on social location and a lot of the things that make us who we are um, as, as people, all the things that intersect, right? Where we were born, what religion we practice, um, our gender pronouns, um, all these things. And a huge part of my primary motherland, Puerto Rico, um, has been since you know, 1492, since 
um, the colonizer sailed through the ocean has been that um, our, our this sort of identity struggle of and, and mixture and colonization and oppression um, in the hands of first Spain and and then the United States, right? So um, my practice is centered in, in in that conversation, that duality of are am I from over there from from the the empire or am I from over here? Am I from Puerto Rico and all those things that make make me as a person, as an individual, and the culture that is my own um, at the heart of it. And do you have, I'd imagine you land on a different answer depending on the day. Yeah, you, there are so many things, right, that go into, into that and, and feelings and realities, um, right? I think one, of, one tidbit of note that um, most people might not know is in the 50s, um, well, not in the 50s, a little bit earlier, the United States created this gag law in Puerto Rico where we were not able to um, show freely our Puerto Rican flag in public. We, you would be jailed or worse if you had a Puerto Rican flag because it was a sign of, of going against the empire, right? And a lot of times I have conversations with people of, you know, why are Puerto Ricans so loud? Why are they always so proud? Why is there so many flags? Why, you know, and I think that's part of, of the things that have made us this stew of being proud is also mm -hmm. that like resilience and that pushback against colonization, uh, against the bigger person telling us this is who you should be. And we're like, mm -hmm. oh, hell no, that's not who we are. We, we know who we are. How does that show up for you um, individually, you was, you know, you and your your everyday life. So, and I'm, and again, one of the things in talking with the folks that are on that are in this discussion today, my introduction is me being not transparent because clearly I'm uh, not clearly I'm from here, right? Yes. So I'm I'm mindful of of the terrain of this conversation. I am a visitor here, right? Mm -hmm. So in that, uh, we were talking before about what does that do. Uh, for you. So as a person of, as a black woman, I know that there, I'm supposed to double Dutch. I'm supposed to, you know, there are things culturally that are expected. Yeah. There are things um, culturally that I, that I hear and that I want. And that's just from the things that I've, that I've pulled out of, <laughs> that I pull out of black ether. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So that experience of your, you're very aware of the impact of colonization, really heady. You know, yeah. all the ism, very meta. Yeah. But at the end of the day, in real life, when you go to Walgreens or when you're reaching out to a, what is, how does all of that awareness show up for you? Is it an empowerment? You know, you like, I've got this behind me to be loud and proud. Is it, um, you find yourself trying to prove how American you are or Puerto Rican you are or in between, I don't, what does all of that look like for you? Yeah. I think at the, for me at the end of the day, it's I, I don't think that I have anything to prove. I hmm. am very authentic in my being, um, and it's how does it show up in me? It can be in my language. Um, it a, a lot of times I use a lot of Puerto Rican words that might not mean anything for you know other Spanish speakers um, in my in my cooking, in my culture, and within my own home. Um, in the actual physical space of my home, the cooking. Um, uh, a lot of, of being Puerto Rican too is, is music um, and that we are, we are loud and proud of it. Um, I think also in, in this time and space we're living in, in America, um, we are, Spanish has become an issue, like, like language. Um, who, what do you mean? Um, be fearful of, of speaking Spanish in certain spaces, right? Um, okay. And and that that has that has shown up for me, right? Living between both lands in a place where I am right now, Spanish is the main language. But in the U.S., it, it, there is no first like official language in the U.S., but English is the dominant one. So it's I like I love it. You it, said there is no first language, but English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Um, so yeah, in times like you mentioned, going to Walgreens and, and if I'm like on the phone with my mom, sometimes I'm a little bit fearful of, and then I'm cognizant and aware of those things and my surroundings of like, 
should I be, am I allowed to be speaking Spanish right now in a space um, that, um, and allowed, right, again, colonization and, and, and that idea of like, do I need to ask for permission? Um, but, but then again, there is that other side of me where I'm like, I'm gonna speak Spanish, fuck that. You know, like, yeah. I, yes, I am gonna speak Spanish and I'm gonna blare my music and I'm gonna do what I want and I'm gonna live authentically um, so that those, those dynamics sort of go into play a lot in, in my day to day. Wow, that says so much too, just the, the conscious decision to have mm -hmm. a conversation on your cell phone, right. in your native tongue, mm -hmm. because you're in public, um, and all the things that does and does that could and couldn't do. Um, right. There is an awareness, but I hear you saying you're you're cognizant, like you said, but it's not anything that you're having to navigate, maybe anymore, being being full grown. Right. right. Excellent. So I would be curious, I'd be interested. I have a question about how that may have been different in your younger years. Um, but I want to save that and I'm going to ask our next guest to make his way to the screen. And so I'm inviting Mr. Connor Williams to join us in the conversation. How are you? I'm good, Dasha. Thank you. So what were you in the middle of? What has your day been like today? Oh, uh, a lot of Zoom meetings and uh, took a walk around the neighborhood. Uh, enjoyed the the trees and the warmth today. Um, um, enjoying my family. I've, my wife and I have three daughters and they're all at home at the moment. And, oh, and nice. It is nice. I uh, appreciate that. Um, are they are they from out of town and home or are they off to college and home? How so it sounds like them being home is a is a, is not an is not a normal thing. No, our eldest daughter Maeve uh, is in college. She's a junior at McGill University in Montreal and so mm -hmm. she's home. She was actually on a semester in Africa when coronavirus started and um, she came home from Tanzania and was um, disappointed that her time in Africa was cut short. Um, mm. And um, my middle daughter, uh, Lena, is in high school. She's a junior in high school and my youngest daughter is in her last year of middle school. So okay. they're at each at different stages in life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So overall, so you're, uh, you're in zoom meetings and my husband Kima, I'm telling everybody he's become a zoom master. So, you know, <laughs> so just being able to, you know, I thought I was doing something on Facebook, but no, this is a whole nother world. So are you adapting to this relative? I am, world order? Yeah, I am adapting to the, uh, you mean to the zoom or having everybody home? No. <laughs> Both. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm adapting to zoom. I appreciate how, uh, people, um, trying their best to keep things going. And um, I work at Community Advocates that um, tries to help people in need. And um, there's, I appreciate the imaginativeness of people in this current time uh, to um, try to uh, do, do their best and help folks who are in, in great need. And um, I'm conscious of the fact that uh, my wife and our three kids and I um, have plenty of space in our house and uh, and um, th but that's not true for all people. So um, yeah. very true. That's where I'm at. I was in a discussion earlier, and uh, this definitely is a being very clear. I know for me personally, what day to day really means. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a different authenticity to all of our gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a chance to just to kind of sit and and like you said, have this this moment together one of the discussions she described us all as wind you know she said as this collective force what wind by itself just seems really soft and not very powerful but all of us together we're all making sure that our neighbors are eating we're making sure that folks that we that we only tangentially know are safe and secure and that's not so much new to us human folk but we definitely uh, um it's it's refreshing to talk more about all the things that people are doing um, because there, that's happening too. Yes, it's a lot of, like you said, people that are not in safe scenario throughout the space, but there's a lot of really great human energy effort that's in place as well. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to know, to, to move into the idea about uh, the idea of motherland, where did that invitation take you? So you give us a little bit about your relationship to having dual home hearts. Sure. So I was born and raised in Dublin and Ireland um, uh, in a 
yeah, with eight brothers and sisters, uh, and there was 11 years between us nine kids, so we were all very close. And um, I, the I was at the tail end of the family, and after university, I went and lived in Sydney, Australia for a couple of years. And while I was down there, I fell in love with um, a girl from Milwaukee, Lisa Hoyler, and she and I subsequently got married, and that's how I ended up here. And um, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> that's two of us and um but um so i've ended up here and um i i one of the things i think about myself um uh, i left ireland for two reasons one was i found certain parts of and i couldn't actually tell you whether this was just my family or the wider culture but i found aspects of the um culture i grew up in uh confining and that might just be because I'm the eighth child of nine kids, and um, <laughs> it's kind of hard, kind of hard to tread your own path because so many paths have been. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, a lot of my brothers and sisters went to London. You know, it's interesting. I appreciated um, CK was talking about um, this uh, issue of colonialism. Um, so a lot of my brothers and sisters went to London, uh, and London is like. Uh, a lot of folks from Milwaukee might end up going to Chicago or New York or Los Angeles for some time when they're young and uh, trying to um, um, find their way in the wider world. A lot of Irish people go to London as the big city. And um, I didn't want to go to London. I remember I'd, I'd gone to London to visit one of my brothers and sisters. And I, I remember it happening in a taxi. And... Uh, the English guy was saying, "Oh, another bloody, love, another bloody patty," and they, you get, uh, as an Irish person, you can get pigeonholed in London, in England, and that part of that is because Ireland was um, England's first colony or Britain's first colony, and um, oh. so I thought, if I want to, I want to go out in the white. I thought, well where can I go this far away and uh, where they speak English because that's what I grew up speaking and that's one of the reasons I went to Australia. Australia is about as far away as you can get from Ireland and um, part of it was curiosity, part of it was um, um, find my own space I suppose. Um, but um, uh, I, th there's that duality of um, so uh, one thing I, I think about is being an outsider and um, living in different cultures. My wife and I also lived in Africa for a couple of years in Botswana in Southern Africa um, on something similar to the Peace Corps. It was through the Irish government. My wife taught in a high school and I worked in the um, Ministry of Commerce and Industry on industrial policy. And um, I, um, at the beginning of, I remember at the beginning of being in Botswana, I used to ride the, um, the buses, the little buses into work, um, they're like um, mini, mini buses. Mm -hmm. you pay a small amount of money and hop in the thing. And I was the only white person and I felt un I, I felt uncomfortable. It was it was like a, a role reversal. And then um, obviously the light bulb goes off in my mind that um, uh, how, it, how it was for people of color in Ireland growing up. They, they were the ones who were like, um, who stuck out there. And, um, and anyway, the older I get, I'm 55 now, the older I get, the more I appreciate um, life is fruitfully lived uh, when we are, when at least part of our our time, our personhood is um, that we are an outsider. And, um, and that I, in some respects, we're all outsiders. Uh, some people run through life trying to hide that, um, but um, claiming that is a liberating thing. And um, I, I'm neither American nor am I Irish. When I go back to Ireland, people say, oh, you have an American accent. And and the Ireland I left is different than the Ireland that I go back to to visit with my kids. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's moved on. So sometimes I feel out of place in both places, but that's not all bad. And um, my kids love their Irish family. Um, um, and I love going back there with them. They see things with new eyes and they help me see things with new eyes. <laughs> and I, I, the older I get, the more I, um, the more forgiving I am of some of my brothers and sisters' shortcomings and the more I appreciate, more appreciative I am of um, um, things that I, in the past I took for granted. Um, mm. 
So I, I, um, that's, that's part of what I, what I think. And how often, uh, you took your, were able to take your girls back. So they've been a few times or have they been regularly? Very regularly. I'd say two out of every three years we get home. Um, there's a direct flight from Chicago to Dublin and it's, uh, when, if you're, if you're, my, my wife is very, um, good with, um, uh, with airfares and stuff. She's a, she's able to get us home generally for a reasonable amount of money. So two out of every three years we get home with our, with our kids. And we obviously stay with family when we get home and they get to spend time with their cousins. And mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that a lot. My mother's 90 now. So, um, it's, I, each, each time I get home, it's like a bonus. I'll say what's interesting in listening to you talk. It feels less like I have a, uh, it feels like someone in their, in their relationship with their hometown. I mean, I know you're talking about a whole country, but a relationship with a whole town and you want to go make your own way, um, see what else is out there in the world. And outside of your accent being, um, I being having, uh, was it brogue, right? Having the, I having the accent here and being Americanized there outside of that, um, and you've been in other places so you can appreciate, like you said, what it's like to not have the attention on you to be the outsider and, and make your way. Um, but that is, is different. It sounds and feels different than um, having a tension between one or the other. So you pretty much settled on I'm neither and I'm just a, the citizen of the globe. In a way, yeah. There's. Um, uh... There, uh, there's another thing um, I appreciate um, in uh, I, I appreciate the Bible study at uh, at our church and um, I, actually our pastor's daughter had gone to um, Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, many years ago and she gave a sermon at church she was in the Eastern Congo and she was doing peace and justice work mm -hmm. The people she was working with had very uh, immediate needs for safety and food, and she ended up um, uh, shouting at a, a um, shouting at a, a member of the military who was shaking down the local people for money because he hadn't been paid, and there was the, the threat of violence mm -hmm. in the money. And uh, she shouted at him, saying, "What are you doing? These are your own people. You, you're supposed to protect them." And then she went home, and she was thinking. Boy, I'm just stupid. That he could have. That was just a dangerous thing to do. And what the hell am I doing here with doing peace and justice work? People have immediate needs for food and security. And um, she came to a really nice um, reflection that I liked. That um, in the in the Bible it talks about the kingdom of God, but we don't. Most of us don't live in kingdoms. That we don't have kings and queens any longer. And uh, that, that that word can be as uh, as um, as well translated as the culture of God. And that's closely uh, connected with Dr. King's term, the beloved community. Yes. And the older, so one thing I think is um, all human cultures with some aspects about them that are um, reflective of the beloved community, where we give of our best to each other and, um, and, and um, support each other to, um, in healthy relationships. Sure. And all, all human cultures have some aspects of them that are un unhealthy. And uh, I was thinking about, boy, there's certain things in the Irish culture that we really could do with over here in the United States in the culture that we live here. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's certain things in American culture that, um, like, uh, that are healthier than aspects of the Irish culture. And um, so, and, and I, the, the, so that's what my thinking is, is that any culture I go into, there's some aspect that's consistent with the, the culture of God or the beloved community. And what are the aspects that aren't that maybe I, I won't uh, participate in? Sure. I love that comparison of culture of God and the beloved community. And, is, and it sounds like then your charge, you know, not that you don't have your own life mission, is getting the folks from both cultures to listen to you. That's all. That's all. That's all. You've got a definitely a wise word. I'm going to have you take a step into the green room and I'm going to bring our artist onto the screen. Um, but I've definitely made a note about that community, um, beloved community. And I would definitely want to get a sense of the things that your children were able to 
receive from having this connection to Ireland in a way that you said was refreshing for you? Was excellent. So Al, this whole conversation, as I mentioned, about that motherland was prompted by a film, a short film that was put together by an, um, a Nigerian artist who is in America, um, has also ex ex existed between both lands for some time. And the project particularly lands on this conversation. And so I'd like to get a little more inf information from him to set this up. How are you, sir? I am very well, thank you. Look at me, you are, we're marching, isn't it? You, you are the- I know, I wall. know, I, I went, I oh, said- I, I to saw it my wall, I said, huh, and then she had to just come, just- <laughs> <laughs> Right, 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 you, yeah, you're not gonna be the only one bright, you're not gonna be the only one bright. So how are you in this, in these, in these new times, sir? Um, it happened in three steps. It devastated me at first because um, I have been through a lockdown before. I was, uh, I was in Nigeria at some, at some times when there was, communal wars, so there were curfews, we couldn't go out of the house, but I've never been in a world where everybody is indoors. So it devastated me at first because it affected um, how I keep the lights on when it comes to work and uh, making money. You know, so I, I, I wanted to be like everybody and take it on my chest, but no, I, I couldn't because I'm a, I'm a mover. You know, I like to up, be up and about, but um, so it, it, it knocked me down a little bit Pulled feet from under my rock, uh, from uh, pull my feet from uh, the rock from under my feet, but mm -hmm. I was able to get myself up, dust myself up, and then um, decided to okay, uh, look into my shelf that has packed up dust of things that I've been wanting to do, things that I've been thinking about, things that I'm doing that I might be sure I really want to do them. Yeah. Um, so I was able to prioritize and just now start picking out things one by one, and then dusting them off and seeing okay, what are we doing with you? What are we doing with you? What are we doing with you? And now I've been able to realize that, okay, okay, there are things that I thought I didn't want to do anymore that I actually can still do. The issue, with the, the reason why I didn't do them before was because I was busy focusing on life and forgetting about me. Um, and then there are other things that I've come to realize that I love so much and I wasn't giving enough time to, you know, because I was trying to keep, uh, which is family. Yeah. I was trying to do things to sustain family, but forgetting that I have to be with the family, which is the real sustenance, besides using other things from outside to actually make it happen. So it's been a it's been a sweet and sour experience, but I mean mm -hmm. a good mix, a really good mix. Most definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, we've uh, we definitely two two sets, I mean everyone, everyone. But early on there are two groups of folks that that uh, I was worried about. Mm -hmm. First no, the second would be folks who don't know how to do their own hair. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> I, you know, but you that's you can and be good, right? I know, don't get me wrong, all my barbers out there, I understand there's a science and a pot. I am not undermining the process of a great bald. I'm not. But I'm, just saying, I'm just saying, compared to some folks who need to do other things, you can knock that out. I hear that. I hear and that. The, second, the first group that we were worried about, you're still in that too, mm -hmm. are the outside kids. The folks who I just, I, you, you're, you're a caged. Oh my God. <laughs> you need to hug people. You need to be, you just need to be out and about. So you can only to. take so many walks around the block. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you had a dog, that dog would be out walked. I know. <laughs> So I appreciate that, um, but even in that, all of us are are um, I, I'm I'm even moving past the language of forced, right? So we yeah. have the space of being able to uh, of really observe and find other things. So you found these projects that were for all the other reasons that matter before not actualized or they were in different <laughs> stages. Tell us a little bit about um, not supposed to be here. Was that one of the projects on the shelf? Oh no, not supposed to be here has, um, no, okay. I'm not supposed to be here was in, was not on the shelf. You know, the only part of it that's on the shelf was the release because I was going to plug it into festivals, you know, and uh, some openings, but I've not been able to do that because of obviously the, the, the situation. So I'm glad we're doing this right now. But it was inspired by many experiences that I have been through since living in America. I came to America the first time in my life in 2008. And I lived in New York for about four and a half, five years. And um, I went to film school there, did a lot of um, 
internships, did some work, music videos, docu-series, you know, gained experience. But then I wanted to go back home uh, to Nigeria, where I'm uh, from, and uh, give my experience back to the industry that I know, also in Nigeria. And it did work out well. I ended up working for MTV. There was senior channel manager, senior creative director for the Viacom brand, and MTV for two years. A responsible for was going into 35 million homes on a daily basis. It was a lot of work, but it was challenging. It was great. You know, and then I came back here because well, what I failed to mention is I met a girl in New York, from Chicago. And uh, yeah, she's my wife today. So that's why I'm back in Milwaukee. I'm um, here in Milwaukee because her father was ill. I, I, I never thought I was going to be in Milwaukee. I'm in Milwaukee. No, I'm a city boy. I lived in London, lived in, South, uh, in Johannesburg, lived in New York, you know, lived in Lagos, all bubbly cities, right? And then I end up in Milwaukee because my wife's father was ill and uh, he's a great man, great guy. I said, you know what, let's go there. Let's go be support system. So and then I just realized that, okay, Milwaukee is not so bad because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a city that has a small town feel, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just like little pockets of things everywhere. And I really like that. What I discovered was that not too many people were discovering the neighborhoods, but I decided to. So not supposed to be here was actually inspired by my, my move to New York, to Milwaukee, because I don't mean to sound like this, but I got a job to keep the lights on while I was trying to find my footing in Milwaukee. Okay. It's not easy to just pack your family and move to a new, to a new city and then uh, plug into exactly what you know how to do. And then I met a lot of people that look like me, that don't look like me. But many of the issues that I had with people in Milwaukee, where the issues with people that look like me. First of all, my accent, they always tried to make fun of me. They always uh, went the whole Kunta Kinte, Eddie Murphy, hey, Africa, hey. Mm-hmm. Well, they were trying to put me down. So one of, what I said to one of the guys was, where, where are you from? He said, Milwaukee. Have you ever left Milwaukee? He had never left Milwaukee. He had only been to Appleton and back. <laughs> Do you even have a passport, an international passport? Mm-mm. I said, so you know what? You need to sit the fuck down. Pardon my French. Oh, we speak all languages. It's okay. Guess what? I have at least three passports that have full stamps. See, I sound like, I said, you are only like 120th or 125th of the world. 20, the, the other 24 of the fraction doesn't sound like you. So you need to leave your neighborhood. If I even go to Chicago first before you can come and step to me. Yeah. You know? And then I've had many other people say, you're coming here to take our opportunities. I'm like, what opportunities? You're, many of you don't even want to work. I'm here working. Whose opportunity am I taking? You know, somebody was always coming at me, your ancestors sold mine. I'm like, are you serious right now? Right now. Yeah, are you really? You know, so I have to do a lot of schooling because I, 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 I'm grateful that I can be here as a black man and freely in America because of the struggles of that black people carried on their backs in the past. You know what? I'm actually grateful for that. And that is why me and my friends started something called Africa's Americans. Not African Americans. Africa's Americans. Ooh! You know, like with apostrophe? Yes. Africa's Americans. Not African Americans. What we're trying to do is make sure that we build a bridge between African Americans and Africa. Africans are the... African Americans are the only ethnic group in America that do not have a connection back home. Mm-hmm. Tell me why. Every other ethnic group in America is doing trade back home with, 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 with the counterparts back home, the yeah. Chinese, the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Irish, the everybody is doing business, even if they've never been back home. Only African-Americans do not have that connection. That is what we are about. Because many of the resources that are in America right now that are feeding the world are coming from Africa. Why do they want you to not have that connection? Why do they not want you to run that? Because they know if you run that, you'll be powerful beyond words, beyond miles, beyond, you know. So I'm not supposed to be here came from that. I put two people in a room, an African-American and an African immigrant. What's the problem? You find that somebody's driving a wedge. And that wedge, these things are not true. They are not true. Somebody's putting that wedge. So that is where um, I'm not supposed to be here came from. Let us deal with 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 these lies that you've been fed. And then let's go over them. Let's now research. I heard something a long time ago that upset me. And because of that, I'm going to teach my son to read a lot and because I read a lot. So if you want to hide something from a black man, put it in a book. We don't like to read. 
And I'm I'm one is I'm gonna go to a clip um and come mm. back and pick up right here All right. because I'd be one interested to understand the difference in how you were received when you were in New York and, oh, tell you that. and how it and how it showed up here. So there's definitely definitely gonna pick up this conversation, but I would like everyone to be on Oh, wait, 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 wait. So this is me trying to be technical and fancy. Hold on. I got this. I got this. I believe in me. I believe in me. Why is there the spirally thing now? This is what my mother would say, the devil is a liar. <laughs> <laughs> this, I have played this a half a dozen times today. Maybe maybe it has expired. It, it's, it's not that difficult. Just you can actually exit and, and, and refresh it. I'm afraid. <laughs> Fear not. All right. Ah, there you go. Freeze! You know nothing. I can't take it just because of papers. Like this old no do is here telling me that my room. Oh, maybe it's the full screen. Thank you, viewers. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. At all! You know nothing about me or my family. So I suggest you stop worrying about my family but yourself, okay? It's just really low because you've forgotten your roots. Forgetting the fact that you're first of all African before you're anything else in the world. Yeah, I'm lost. Okay. I hear you, bro. I ain't got no home, no culture, no place to go, no people. The Chinese got a Chinatown. The Indians, the Russians, we the only people that don't got a direct connect to our roots. Answer me this. Is there an African town? Or do I got to fly to some random continent and yell, I'm home? Nigga, please. Y'all did this to me. Those people took my people and now I'm here. In chain. Look, they're just angry and looking for food for me. They shouldn't be blaming me, bro. Did you guys have a black president? Black president? Man, that nigga from Africa. His daddy came on the plane. Mine came on the boat. And in change, my son had. So now he's African, right? When he was there fighting for you, all of you were like, oh, yes, we can. Oh, yes, we can. Now he's out all of a sudden he caught. Oh, he, he, is he to blame for this same situation that you're in right now? Oh, I forgot. Hell yeah, y'all yeah, ancestors. Them fake ass Africans sitting on their asses sending emails from the African prince. Nigga, that shit is old. Everybody a prince. Must I remind you, you in change too, prince. Oh, you complaining about change now? If any change is your problem, why don't you just sit back, think about it, and ask yourself, who really put you in these chains? Shit. How about you? Who put you in these chains? It's important, therefore. Who put you in these chains? Who put you in these chains? Who put chains? you in these chains? <laughs> so, and, and that's, all of the tensions are there. So like to, to the story that you were sharing where you are, you're greeted with, you know, the Eddie Murphy coming to America and Kunta Kinte roots and, the, and throwing his, history at you. Mm -hmm. um, so as the, as as you as a person, you know, this a young man, an artist, um, an entrepreneur, and you've got these two different cities. So it's you can't. So how do you reconcile this? What you found about this disconnect and how you were received? So talk a little bit more about that. 
It's like what um uh, what's what what's the speaker who spoke before me? Uh, Connor. He said, you know, like when you're from Ireland, you go to London. When you're from Milwaukee, you go to Chicago. You know, New York is a big city, and I've been to many big cities. You know, and um, so New York is a melting pot. New York has everybody living there. If you actually go to New York, you'll find that um, New York as a center itself, Manhattan, Brooklyn as a whole, has so many people living in it that it's it's a lot easier to just come from, to just be anybody, to be anything, to be a different color, to be a different sex, to be whatever you want to be. Because mm -hmm. it's a melting pot, you know, so so guess what? So you get a pass, you do get a pass. But when you come to, to the Midwest, for instance, you know, where they say Milwaukee is the most segregated city, you know, so, and, and, and for me, it is beyond black and white. Mm. It is, the segregation is beyond black and white. Segregation has, an undertone in almost everything going on in the city. It is between African Americans, African immigrants. It is between the Asians that I met. The the, the even even between the, I, I met. A, I have a guy who's a, a Chinese guy who knows a Japanese girl who his parents say, "No, you guys can't be together. We don't mix." And they say they have a community here of the Hmongs. No, no, no. She's not Japanese. She's Hmong. The girl is Hmong. He's Chinese. So there's just a lot of separation, and he's glaring. Milwaukee is not a place that is afraid to show it. It's an us against them. You said we're not afraid to show it. Like, no, 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 let me show <laughs> mm -hmm. you. Like, so we can't wait to show you our segregation and our racism. Yeah, and, like, and it's a mindset, too. It's mm -hmm. a mindset, too. You compared it to being in New York where you have a pass and it's an open city. Mm -hmm. um, and you're used to, you're accustomed to all different types of everything coming through, whereas because in this particular city, because it's so segregated, whether you are coming in from another place, you can be coming in from the other side of town because we're, we, the city has been structured in a way where you only keep within these pockets. Coming from the other side of town, you're bringing things that are making me question I know. what I've got here. Um, I'm not even going to mention the name of the company where I worked. There were, there were people that were like, oh, you Northside folk. Oh, no, you West Side folk. Oh, mm. No, no, no. No, we don't deal with you guys. Oh, you're River West? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So for you, you've got it in two layers. One from what side of town, and two, mm -hmm. you add, you've got a whole other continent involved. Yeah, no, so, I, saw, I, I just saw different layers of it. Different, so many layers. I'm like, oh, my God. It is, it, is, it is so disheartening to know that people don't understand what it means when, when, when you come together, what you can achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, so I chose the um, uh, I'm not supposed to be here dealing directly with what has affected me personally, mm. you know, because I think that deep down inside, if we knew what we had, we will not be focused on the distractions that have been thrown to towards us. Most we definitely. are rushing for crumbs as opposed to sitting at the head of the table. There's so much, almost every cell, cell phone, every cell phone in America has a chip a chip component that comes from Congo. That comes from Congo. We have so many resources that if black people were the ones to control these resources and export these resources to the mm. rest of the world, do you know the power? Do you understand? I'm mm -hmm. watching you yesterday, and then uh, African-Americans are just the 13% of the country are the ones high, most highly affected by coronavirus. How are you such a minimal number and then being the ones being wiped out the most because yeah. we've been exposed to you know I, I, I don't know I, I i i might not be the most on point but i think that everything comes from lack of knowledge lack of um seeking all that knowledge and lack of focal points within the community to put things together I'd be curious and i'm going to bring everyone onto the screen now how you how that conversation is received Right. So you you're again, you're pushing through. You're talking to someone, whether they're in New York or my Miami, Milwaukee, Houston. You're talking to an American person of color, America, a black American mm -hmm. who is going to receive you mm -hmm. for better or for worse in a particular. Yeah. Um, and your hope. And so I think that's interesting. So outside of it, without no, without hearing you speak, you're a black man in this country. Right. So you're still navigating all of the pieces. So to to you and I will definitely um, invite everyone that part where you're really because of your experience and the folks, you have another 
set of folks waiting at another place that you call home, mm -hmm. you come into every conversation, every interaction with a um, a more dimensional appreciation. Right, all of you from your from deciding to speak Spanish or not, from knowing that you made a choice to be in this space um, and what you're choosing to share with your family or not, so that's a gift. Um, but I can imagine in that moment, in that conversation, or in that text thread, it can be stressful. So how you how you manage the American version? of the people you're trying to, you know, you want, all of you want to fix and save and talk to, um, and how you as a person keep yourself and all of your identities healthy. <laughs> uh, I'll make this short. I have the Nigerian identity, which I'm very, very proud of. Uh, Nigerians have a bad reputation because we're the biggest black nation. We're over 200 million people. So a few people have given us a bad rep. However, people don't talk about the good things. Donald Trump called us a shithole country. Meanwhile, we are the most progressive set of people that have my, make immigrants into this country. The number of doctors, teachers, you can check it, the, the, the numbers are there. But nobody talks about those. People want to talk about the bad things. You know? So I'm very proud of my heritage. I go anywhere and I do not change how I sound. If you don't hear me, I will speak slower for you, but I'll ask you also, try to train your ear. When you tell me, yes, you have an accent, I'm like, you have an accent too. <laughs> there is no one way of speaking. And until we are able to affect people on local, in little, little pockets, we will not do the big picture. When I go to the store and then somebody, I say, can I have, they're like, what do you say? I don't hear you. I'm like, ah, you need to listen. Okay, so I'm going to speak lower. And I speak slower. Did you hear me? They're like, uh-huh. I'm like, so can you also slow down for me next time? Ooh. People do not want to, to, people don't look in the mirror. You know, the moment you are something that doesn't start seem like them, people just go, uh, forgetting that if I place you somewhere else, it's going to be worse for you. I come from a place where there are still black people on the money. You get, when you go there, when you get Hello a place, again. Yes, I, I come from a place where there are still black people on the money. I come from a place where I, 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 I walk into a place and I can walk into anywhere. My money is as good as your money. There are places that I try to go to here, they'll be like, oh, no, no, don't go there, G. Only white people go there. I'm like, oh, are they spending money? I'm like, yeah. Okay, what well, I'm doing there. I'm going there. Do you get? I'm not used to anybody telling me I can't go anywhere or do anything. Do you understand? I am. If my wife would tell you the truth, I didn't want to move here. I do not feel that like anywhere is superior to me. I am here because I, ch I, ch I chased love. Love brought me here, and I'll go with her anywhere. Right. Her father is sick. He's like my father. So, so. This is me now ending up by saying that, you know what, I am proud of anywhere I am and I will live with anybody, but we also have to let people understand that, you know what, it could be the reverse. You could be where I'm from at some point and it will be difficult. Most definitely. I want to um, give a shout out to Raven and Lisa who brought the two, you know, who drug me <laughs> all to this game. <laughs> and we have our uh, our tech our tech expert on the screen. Um, he's you can't see him, but he was also a drug to this city because of love. <laughs> um, shout out to Kim and my husband. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate that. And you said something. I'm going to take it back to to um, to CK. You were talking about this idea. I'm not going to change who I am. Um, I'm not going to change the way that I operate. But you also you came into this experience as a full grown up, right? So even though you were young, and we're never just you're not grown at 22. <laughs> Wait, I'm, wait. I'm talking. No, no, no. I'm talking to you. Twenty-two. You're, you're not. You're almost grown. You're in a grown-up internship. But anyway, so you had a different uh, um, understanding of things. Yeah. So CK differently. You came as a young person, mm -hmm. and maybe not had. Maybe didn't have that same um, bold confidence about who you are and where you come from. Um, and Connor, by the time you came here, it sounded like too, you also had, you went through that in London already. So by the time you landed here, you'd also brushed off some of those, those, mm -hmm. those hater vibes. But for all of you, being able to stand on your two, you know, and your two has American soil and other soils and other experiences and you combat people who are just 
in the definition of the word ignorant, just don't know, not a judgment of what they will or are not willing to do. They just don't know um, and haven't been coached to appreciate. So kind of a survival tip for others who are managing loving both places and being perceived through stereotypes because of all the things. Heal the people, heal the people. So CK, you were talking about as a youth. So we'll start with you and I'll just want everyone to please share just following up with what um, um, uh, Katoon shared with, started with. Yeah, I, I don't know like sort of like where to go with, with all that, but yeah, like you mentioned, I did grow up in Puerto Rico and I came into as a kid and, and a lot of that um, sort of instilled in me what, is, what assimilation is, right? Like I grew up in Milwaukee, but at the same time in Puerto Rico and and it, it helped me sort of understand how to navigate both places. Um, and in the beginning, when I first moved as a full grown person to Milwaukee was in 2007, I was 20 years old. Um, and I had already lived in Puerto Rico for a huge part of my life. I went to through high school, my full high school experience was in Puerto Rico. So as a kid, like I, I, I wasn't as aware of all those power dynamics and ignorance, like you were saying, Katung. Um, and um, as an adult, when I arrived, it was a shock to my system to yeah. see that, right? And, and, and back to your point, Katung, of, of the accent issue, people wouldn't believe me that I was from Puerto Rico because I don't have the right. accent. Because right. they expected, the expectation of what the Midwest and the people of Milwaukee expected to me to be was did not fit in their in their idea of Puerto Ricanness, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when they would say that to me, it's like you're not you're not giving me a praise. That's an insult. Just because you're say, telling me that you, oh you don't have an accent, it's like saying that the rest of my people that do have an accent aren't equally as educated or have to, like it, there's just so many levels and layers to that to that comment, right? It's like uh, wait wait a second, like. So I still had to figure out and, and navigate when I went back to Milwaukee and the niceties of the Midwest um, as an adult, even though I did grow up in both places, like I still had to like dodge things and be like, wait, wait, what, what is this? And, and, and really think about what was going on and all the redlining that, that still <laughs> happens to this day. Yeah. So do we just all hop on, Dasha? Or okay, yeah. I mean, CK, I told. Sorry for being late here on the game about accents, but yes, there's definitely there was definitely a lot of in, as well when I was growing up here um, in Wisconsin, just right away being placed as a translator. So being bilingual, you know, you're that's your first job, <laughs> like out of the womb, is to you know your first gen is to translate for your family and so forth. Um, but yeah, I and I totally can relate to just the disparities and, um, you know, is it denial of the motherland? Is it there's definitely you grow up here colonized and like there's definitely a shame value that comes with being, um, you know, from another country and, and claiming that motherland. And also because thinking about the word mother, right? I mean, in this content, in this country, you know, having that matriarchal ties is not seen as a strength. So I'm like, who's your hero? Mi abuelita, you know, my grandma <laughs> is my hero, right? And so, you know, that's not valued in this con in this country, in this context. And, and a little bit maybe because we're in the Midwest, it's always like, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstrap. And that, um, that mentality is transcends, but certainly, when it comes to accents, I feel you <laughs> on that one, bro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Connor, what about you? Is there a, um, a, a, a lesson or something that you've heard particularly from this discussion? Or we definitely want to hear your, your outgoing thoughts about Motherland. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine, Joyce Elwanger, shared a, uh, a Haitian expression years ago. Uh, you see the world from where you stand. And... Um, I often have thought that the truth is uh, uh, is in a sphere, and um, as you stand in different places, different parts of the truth are revealed to us. Hmm. And as we're in community with people who see the world from different places, 
we come to gain insight that we're otherwise blind to. But um, I, uh, I, 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 I too found uh, uh, initially Milwaukee uh, uh, an uncurious place for um, uh, for for being an outsider to come into, and um, and I. Um, uh, I appreciate openness in people that are interested in the wider world, um, but um, uh, I, I don't know. That, that, that's all I'd say. Mm -hmm. That's helpful too. You appreciate an openness. Uh, you appreciate people who have an openness for the wider world, and everyone won't. So I think to the 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 impulse of folks who can appreciate the wider world. We want everyone to have the same appreciation that we do. So uh, Connor, I spent also have visited Botswana several times and and can and I'm an army brat. So at my core, appreciating that you intersect with people and there's so many different way, places that we all come from. There's different ways to cook cornbread. Don't get me started. I've had a whole thread on my face. <laughs> um, but I'm just saying, I, I everyone won't have that background. So there's a lot of grace in knowing that you have a privilege of knowing that there is a world outside of this area code, outside of this, outside of these state borders, outside of these nations' borders, and the entire globe, we all inhabit it together. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sharing your personal narratives. Katoon, thank you also for sharing your art. This film uh, prompted this entire conversation. So I know that I understand that you're you're taking that film out and you're showing it in different places. We have your website. So if there's if people want to continue sharing it, showing it, and having this discussion, and you have other pieces in uh in your what is your closet of films, so we look at those. <laughs> I want to say there. something quickly before you go. I yeah. want to add something to those. Many of us who are sitting here are able to sit here because we've been able to, even if we're in a box at some point, because we've been able to actually step out of it. Hmm. Now, the majority of the folks that have that have our experience of having to travel from one place to the other are still not confident. They are not, be, they are not, they are not able to be productive or 100% because they're trying to fit in. Right. What I did, with my, my, I am a little fortunate because I've been to a lot of places and I've, I went to a military school, you know, I, so I, I, there's rebellion in me and I was able to break out many things and say, you know what, screw this, I'm gonna do this. But not everybody has that. Hmm. And. I find that when you are trying to conform, you will not be productive. When you are trying to live by the standards people set for you, you die inside, you know, and you cannot produce. And I, I know this from, 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 from where I worked, the first place I worked, where I knew, where all these things were happening. A couple of guys were from my country and this was their first time out, in, out of Nigeria. You know, they made it to America somehow, you know, and then, they, they got a job, but they were trying to live by the standards. And they, won't, they kept on asking me, how do you do it? Because me, I walk in there and I'm like, yes, the African is here. What do you want to say to me? I, I, I put it in your face. Because of how badly they, they, they try to treat me, no, I turned it around. That is who I am. So okay. when, I was, when, I was, when I was resigning, I got a food basket from the supervisors. People said they have not done that to anybody in the 19 years they've been there. And you know why? Because I owned me. I did right. not do them. I owned me. They made fun of me initially. I'm like, ah, 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 this joke is going to be on you right now. Nice. So I need people to understand that the more of you you are, the better you will be. Take the little time of rejection. It will come. Nobody will want to accept you immediately. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It will soon become the cool thing because you're the one who stands up. You are different. You understand? When they ask me, what did you say? I said, if you don't understand me, ask me. I will repeat it. I promise. I say Slowly. It. I will repeat it for you slowly. Ask me, you. I will repeat it. You get. I love what CK said. When CK said that sometimes just uses words that don't affect. But guess what? Because you're trying to own your stuff. Sometimes you have to take an extra step because guess what? It's a war against you. Absolutely. It is. That's very true. That is very true. And doubling if you're a woman, you know, we are talking about the motherland, and I hate to, you know, three men here and only two women here. You know, we gotta. You There's know, definitely I mean, spaces come. for women to like, you know, express and, and own that. And so I'm grateful that you're you're putting that in front and center for for all of us because there's definitely enough space in the, on the table for that. Yes. For sure. 
Thank you. Yes. I love that. So be more of you and less of them and own mm -hmm. how and just own how you show up and all of the all of the questions mm -hmm. that come with that. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank all of you again for sharing your stories. Um and and we've we've enlightened each other. We've definitely inspired the folks who are watching and we'll do all of the internet -y things that need to happen to get this conversation out. But in this moment for this hour that we spent together, I know that I've been enriched and I really appreciate all of you sharing um this part of you. And we have two more of these digital about that series that are coming through. So we are going to come together um on the 11th on Monday, and we're going to do a revisit of About That Baby Daddy. So our <laughs> artist <laughs> gotta happen. We had this conversation in person um, at the retreat, but of course, Rona, she's having everybody revisit everything. So we're going to revive that dialogue um, and have some other folks on stage. And so our our artist is my partner, actually, Kima Hamilton. He has an, audio, an audio project that he started that's, that's, com that's turning into a podcast and it's a conversation about the stigma for non-custodial parents and the culture of 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 co-parenting and our second and our, our excuse me our third and our last about that discussion for this month will be on the 21st and it will be about that pronoun so it will be a conversation we have folks that, that will be on the screen who are um, who have chosen they who are, are transgender and it's all about the etiquette the evolution the confusion and the culture of of identity and gender and our artist and the art will be poetry so we will be working with stephanie burt's her po her book about above the lights is a nea big read and so she's going to be with us and we'll have our other kickstarters like our guest tonight who will get that conversation started so make sure you subscribe to the retreat mke on youtube uh, make sure you Friend us on Facebook so when these events happen, they can just pop up and, and make sure that they are bringing all of this amazing conversation directly to all of your devices. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being thoughtful. And thank you for being you. Just like they said, show up as you because nothing else is going to work. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank everyone. Have a great night. Bye. 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 Bye.